from your favorite source for Chicago White Sox talk, delivering news, interviews, analysis, and more. This is the Sox Machine Podcast with your hosts, Jim Margulis and Josh Nelson. Thanks, Rob, and welcome to the Sox Machine Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Nelson, and it's Monday, September 18th, 2023. The Chicago White Sox just wrapped up their second-to-last homestand and their American League Central games for the season as they lose 3 out of 4 to the Minnesota Twins by a combined score of 30-11. to Great effort, boys! What's eye-opening at the very least is that Pedro Grafal continues to talk. Is he saying anything relevant? Well, maybe? There's a lot of confusion in the messaging both Grafal and Chris Getz are putting out publicly about what to expect from the White Sox in the near future. The expectation is that the White Sox can contend in 2024, but they want a roster with more athleticism and speed, which is not what they have with the current group of players. So we'll discuss if there is a full-on teardown coming and if the White Sox mixed messaging is just gaslighting everyone. Plus, the White Sox continue to celebrate the 1983 White Sox, but nothing on the docket so far for the 1993 White Sox. And an update on the MLB postseason race, because that in itself is very fascinating and how things are shaking out both in the American and National Leagues. Joining me is the managing editor of SoxMachine.com. It's Jim Margulis and uh, Jim, Pedro Grafal, man. I don't know what to make of him. Well, I do know that he's not a very good manager and he's probably the worst manager in my White Sox fandom. Uh, but he continues to talk and I can't make heads or tails of what he is babbling about because he is very steadfast that he believes this team can contend next year, but not the way they currently play and probably not with the group of players he currently has. It seems like his audience is two people, Chris Getz and Jerry Reinsdorf, and that's about it. Like he <laughs> cares about appealing to them and saying what they want to hear in terms of uh, communicating a cohesive, sensible, uh, relevant message to fans. It seems very much like a secondary concern. Like there's very, there's been very little connection and outreach between Griffal and the fan base all year long. Like even going back to his introduction, um, it seems like a post COVID post Tony La Russa thing to where like, you know, when, when Rick Renterio was manager, he got the Sox Fest introductions. He did charity in the neighborhoods, hospital visits, etc. like part of White Sox charities, very visible, very friendly. Uh, like he had a 70 grade smile. Great to see him out and about with Griffo, Like, I don't recall, like maybe I've missed something, but I, I don't recall him doing the kind of outreach. There was a tour because he, he stopped at Vienna beef. Cause that's just right down the street from where I lived. He visited the same schools that Ricky Renteria also visited, but like his, when he was introduced as manager, yeah, when he was introduced as manager yeah. uh, last November, but no, there's no ceviche cooking class at Sox fest because yeah. there was no Sox fest to introduce Pedro Griffo to the fans. Yeah, and there's been no, like, yeah, I don't recall him even, like, going to hospitals or going to, um, you know, having any kind of charity or cause that he personally championed that he was in the front of. So, like, even, like, LaRusse, I remember the Pets thing, even though that didn't really manifest itself so much with the White Sox, but still, like, you know, there was at least a charitable arm or endeavor that he was, you know, responsible for or passionate about. Like, there's been no connection to the fan base or the general public so like when he was first hired and he said yeah like i want to prepare my team to kick you know their ass every mm -hmm. uh night at 7 10 p.m like yeah pedro Grafol, like get it like they're speaking the same language as fans but as the results roll in he you know his message is divorced from reality or divorced from what fans are seeing and like he had that snippy thing about like well if people don't like my lineups talk to jerry which is like again uh you know his his audience and like as the results have gone from disappointing to unacceptable again no outreach aside from like token messaging of like yeah if i were a fan i'd be pissed off too but like in terms of um you know, how he polices the efforts, how he has the two-tiered 
reactions to effort in which rookies are called out or optioned down and, and veterans get endless supply of forgiveness and grace. Um, it, it's been really disappointing. And then like, you know, I imagine it might be on your docket in terms of what you want to talk about, but the Chris guest comments that Griffo yeah. made yeah. being, uh, well, I'll get to that in a bit, but just like, it makes it very clear that he's only interested in appealing to Jerry Reinsdorf and Chris Getz and everybody else, media, fans, secondary, tertiary, maybe, depending on whether he's saying separate things to Reinsdorf and Getz. So, yeah, I think that's what really makes it terrible in terms of just not only is the strategy suspect in the clubhouse management, you know, probably bad, but in terms of like the public facing aspect of the job, like, he basically ignores that. And I guess it works when Jerry Reinsdorf himself is divorced from the public and doesn't care and has really no um, reference point to what the public thinks about him. And even if he did, probably would just disregard it and do what he wants to do. But like combined with Griffol's complete indifference towards fans, like, man, it just everybody's frozen out. Yeah, there was this quote, and it was in Paul Sullivan's column on in the Chicago Tribune, which, Jim, you highlighted in your column Sunday on SoxMachine.com. And this is the full quote from Pedro Grafal when asked if the White Sox are going to compete in 2024. And Grafal said, quote, why not? If there's ever an opportunity, opportunity to do that, this is it. My suggestion, my advice to everybody who's going to come to our camp next year in 2024 If they truly want to play in the big leagues, they've got to come in with that mindset because they're going to have an opportunity to play. They really are. We share a pretty similar, if not exact, vision on how we want to see this thing look next year. It's pretty neat and cool to know that the general (laughs) manager or the manager see this thing the same way and the style of baseball that we want to play, end quote. So many questions. And we haven't even got to the Chris Getz part yet. Okay, but okay. so many questions in this quote. The Chris Getz thing is like a tirade building up for me. That's a whole separate thing. We're going to get to that. Okay. But the the mindset that Grafal has looking ahead and how he's envisioning spring training 2024. Again, I know I've mentioned this. Pedro Grafal is coaching at the wrong level of baseball. He should not be a major league manager He should be a college baseball coach, Jim, Mm -hmm. because that is how college baseball works. Every single year, you get a lot of new faces and you have a lot of competition to figure out who your team's going to be. You have fall ball to have scrimmages to figure out who you're rolling out with on opening day in February for the college season. That's not how Major League Baseball works when you have contracts when you have players under contract, some players are under lengthy contracts mm-hmm. and having this rah, rah, Oh, we're going to have this type of mindset that everyone must compete for their job in spring trading. Like, I don't know how many professional baseball players want to deal with that type of camp. And now he's saying it's pretty neat and cool to know <laughs> that the general manager, the manager see the same things the same way. Uh, what about last November? What about last December in the off season? Did you not see the same things? You didn't see the things the same way as Rick Khan and Kenny Williams. Like, what are you talking about? Pedro Grafal. So I'll, I'll leave, I'll leave the floor to you, Jim, but I, that quote itself has so many questions. And again, every time Grafal speaks, he just muddies the water on what to expect in 2024. And I would totally understand if White Sox fans are like, yeah, not only am I not watching the rest of this season, mm-hmm. I'm probably going to skip next year as well because it appears that there is no good game plan going on. Yeah, well, like, like I wrote, uh, like basically there were, I don't know, probably five or six points where I just gr- groaned audibly while reading it to the point where I don't know if I stopped one groan to start another. It might have been just like, uh, <laughs> the entire time reading it, just like, yeah, pretty neat and cool. Like those four words. Um, I don't want to like, based on how bland he is, like, I don't, well, one, I don't think Pedro Grafol could process anything is pretty cool. But even if he did, like, I don't think that's what people think is cool. Like, remember me like the uh, Wayne's World, like uh, Noah's Arcade. 
you know, it's chill, it's fresh, it's Noah's Arcade, like hearing him say pretty neat and cool, like probably not neat and cool if you're the one saying it. Like I don't trust you to be a judge of what's neat and cool. Like, well, neat, I could see. Like neat standalone, sure. That sounds like a line parents say, or like, yeah, I'm a parent now, so I guess I'm, you know, I would say, hey, pretty yeah. neat. Pretty yeah. sharp there, kiddo. Yeah, dad. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> cool, like, uh, like, and then he said, like, pretty, sh yeah, with him and Getz, like, we share a pretty similar, if not exact, like, God, he's just kissing up so hard. When, he, like, yeah, we are perfectly aligned. We are um, just, we are in perfect harmony about what we want to see here. He is my new best friend. And, you know, he is the baseball scion. And I aspire to see baseball the way Chris Getz wants to see baseball. So that was the start of the kissing up. So those two, those two groups of words, um, just he it's so insincere or inauthentic just what he's trying to pitch because like i think he's saying like gets is saying the white Sox can, can be competitive in terms of like they can compete for the al central Griffol says like yes i think so too and then he says like yeah we're going to be competitive in the sense that every job is going to be competitive because nobody's a starter and those are two different things so he's like trying to agree while pivoting on changing the definition of competitive and it ends up being completely like if he's trying to use gets his definition while saying like, yeah, no jobs are secure. Like that's bad. Like it's kind of like going to the college football thing of like, if you have two quarterbacks and you don't have one, it's mm -hmm. like, if you have three catchers, you don't have one. If you have three second basemen, you don't have one. If you have three right fielders, you don't have one like and on and on and on. I guess if you have three starters, you're in good shape. Like that's the one exception, <laughs> but uh, that's just what you're looking at. So it's just completely detached. And that's where like, and, and I won't spoil the rest of the Getz quotes, but that is like a case where he's just talking to Chris Getz and everybody else is uh, collateral damage in terms of like trying to be, trying to piece it together or make sense or see anything reasonable about the stance that he's taking. And then the Chris Getz part, uh, this was added mm -hmm. from Sullivan. Based on what Grafal said, Sullivan wrote, that style would be, well, like the way Chris Getz played, according to Grafal. And this was Grafal's quote about Chris Getz. Quote, he was a smart player that ran the bases well and was consistent as consistent could be. That's the kind of baseball he wants to see, and that's the kind of baseball I want to see. End quote. Chris Getz was consistent. He consistently sucked. <laughs> he was a bad baseball player. He ran in the bases 2000, well. Give him that. He did run yeah, the bases well. Yeah, he ran the bases Good stolen well. base percentage. 2009, Chris Getz played 107 games for the White Sox. It was worth 0 0.3 war. <laughs> in 2010, he played 72 games with the Royals. 0 0.3 war. 2011, he played 118 games with the Royals. 0 0.5 war. 2012, 0 0.5 war. Chris Getz never had a season higher than 0 0.5 war. Getz is the definition of replacement level. He hit 250 with a 309 on base percentage and select 307 for his career. He had a 68 OPS plus for his career. And his season high was 73 OPS plus in 2009 with the Chicago White Sox. If Griffal's idea of building a competitive White Sox team is having 10 Chris Getz like players, the 2024 Chicago White Sox might lose 120 games, Jim. Chris Getz was a terrible player. He should not be the example that you are looking to build a new team with. And I hope that Chris Getz understands that he was not a very good Major League Baseball player. And no, as a general manager, I am not looking to fill the roster with 10 me's because you kind of already have one <laughs> of those, and that's Zach Remillard. And if you have 10 Zach Remillards on the 2024 mm -hmm. White Sox, yeah, you're going 42 on 120. Easy. Yeah, Chris Getz, Getz ran the bases well and was as consistent as consistent could be, and he smelled so nicely he smelled like sandalwood and his hair was elderberry yeah perfectly <laughs> quaffed uh, i don't know what he put in it whether it's pomade or whether it's just a gel but always liked the way he did it oh and just you know like when when not in uniform i want to know where he shopped did he have a personal shopper because his clothes were always like the, that's what's the, that's what he's saying basically is just just flattery and like gets has to realize at some point that griffal's just just, you know, sucking up to him, right? Like, 
you have to be able to detect that if you're at Getz's level. And just, you know, because I can tell, like, if I'm being sold something, like, I'm like, yeah, ease up on the flattery. Like, I, I you know, like, it doesn't happen very often, but let's, like, let's say if somebody wants my money. And if it's a real bad sales job where they're just, you know, um, like, yeah, I'm going to be car shopping soon. So, yeah, there's that. But just, you know, when it comes to, you can always tell when, when the compliments are inauthentic or the compliments are just too frequent or like, no, I'm not that girl. What, what are you getting at? What do you want? And that's how it is. So I, I hope that gets understands this and sees this as pretty pathetic because it is like, um, you know, Kenny Williams had that reputation of like drafting the players that he was like really athletic, multi-sport star, uh, alphas, leaders, you know, hard nosed, um, stubborn, maybe to a point and, you know, end up sometimes in Courtney Hawkins and Josh Fields and Joe Borchard and whatnot. Uh, but like, you know, so gets, I can see him like falling into the same trap where we want heady players who run the bases well and give every effort that they have, even though like that just tends to be like a, you know, that falls into a bunch of different tropes, but that's uh, like kind of the danger here. I'm just hoping that Griffol is being like so over the top in his praise that gets us being like, no, I, I know what you're getting at. And we don't see the same. I know why you're saying what you're saying, but no, we need more talented players too. We actually need to get on base in order to talk about how well we're going to run the bases, how fast we're going to be. Uh, because like they both saw it in, um, you know, in Kansas City, Bubba Starling, like athlete that just didn't have baseball skills. So it doesn't matter how like supremely athletic you are. Like if you can't actually like put the bat on the ball or like get the ball in the air or, uh, you know, actually have the hands for your position that you're just going to be like meaninglessly athletic or you're just going to be running around the, the diamond in, in an unorganized way or you're not going to be actually be able to run uh, with purpose because like you're automatically out. And so like, I'm really hoping that the way Griffol is pitching it is just obnoxiously over the top, you know, um, brown nosing and gets is like, you don't need to do that. Like Reinsdorf wants you around. I can't fire you if you want to stop it. <laughs> I'm really hoping yeah. it's that point, but I am somewhat amused by it because it is just, you know, it's, you know, when, when Lawrence uh, mentioned it, you know, uh, you know, saying like, you know, he's an ass kisser. Like he, he, he said that on the air and be like, yeah, I can kind of see it. And then like, you know, John Greenberg said like, he's Jim Boylan. Like, yeah, I can see it. And then like, now you have Paul Sullivan even saying like, he followed up by saying that quote certainly will look good in Griffol's performance review. Like, yeah, that's his way of saying, yeah, he's an ass kisser. And like, that's all he cares about doing. And in this organization, sadly, it goes a long way, but it's so obnoxious and over the top that I'm hoping that like Getz will be like, it's it's maybe so much so that gets to be like yeah we can't uh we got to tone that down and we need to work on our messaging because it's really just terrible pedro Gafal, the brown noser that that's like the lord's titles right uh yeah yeah that's uh that's pedro Gafal. So after his first year with the white Sox. Uh, let's talk about Pedro Grafal as the manager. Uh, complete mm -hmm. lack of effort this weekend. So well done continuing to motivate your players. They won one game, 7-6, to six, and that required a hold on for dear life as the Minnesota Twins had the bases loaded in the ninth inning. Uh, this team is not playing hard. It's really evident when you watch this team in person. And uh, they finished the American League Central play with a record of 23-29. and 29. They only had a winning record this year against the Cleveland Guardians. I don't know how that happened. Uh, they were eight and five against Cleveland, but they had a losing record against Kansas City, six and seven. They were five and eight against Detroit, and they finished four and nine against the Minnesota Twins. And just watching the effort on the field, and it's very lacking, and it's very apparent that it is lacking. I feel like I'm taking crazy pills, Jim, because we got Pedro Grafal saying the things that he's saying. And he's completely over his head and out of touch with reality. And he's replacing Rick Khan as like the team's main spokesperson, putting out mixed messages every day. Maybe we should hear from Chris Getz more often uh, in the upcoming mm -hmm. weeks. But I just, I don't, I can't go through another season talk about Pedro Grafal, Jim. Like I've never been so sure that I am firmly out on a manager. And this is like the third time that I have said that I am out on Pedro Grafal, but he should mm -hmm. be one and done. And the fact that we still have to talk about Pedro Grafal going to 2024 does not give me any more confidence that this team could turn it around. No matter who they add, 
no matter how drastic the moves are in the off season, he's not the guy. He's not the guy. Yeah. No, it's like when it comes to the butt kissing, it, the reason I want him to continue, cause it's like the only way he's entertaining. <laughs> he's just unpleasant basically. And every he's boring. And if he's not boring, he's smarmy. Those are like the only two modes. He's never told a joke. He's never um, expressed frustration with anybody who, you know, should have the money, the bank account to like be able to take it professionally. Like he picks on rookie. So he's a bully, like a little bit in that regard. Like he only, you know, he only punches down, doesn't punch up or at least, um, you know, uh, attack the effort in that regard. So, yeah, it's just, he's, it, it's a pathetic showing, like, as a as a manager, and there's no reason to support him. Like, I mean, it's kind of a, a dog of a product. Like, you know, before the season, I think we all understood that this is, like, a very high leverage managing situation he's entering, and if it blows up, it might not be his fault. It might just be, like, a whole bunch of uh, flaws of this team caving in on itself and there's nothing any manager could do to stop it because Rick Hahn just didn't turn over the roster enough to really give it a different feel. So like it was, it was falling apart on Tony La Russa and whoever takes over is going to just have like uh, just um, shards of a team uh, in their hands. So like there's always that element. So it's like you can't hold the entire performance against Griffol, but like there's just no reason to like him as like a person, even like the introduction that's, you know, go back to the introduction where he has family around and talked very movingly about how much they support him. Like, yeah, okay. Like seems like a decent guy, but like there's just been nothing since then that connects me to him as a person, like, you know, human to human. Um, it's just boring middle manager stuff. And then like this, this, um, because he, you know, spends entire game and Jerry Reinsdorf's owner suite probably, you know, talking about like how bad of a roster he got handed and said that things need to be changed up top and you know, overthrew a con. That's kind of how I like to envision it. But like just it's uh ever since like he got his vote of confidence, he's just been even more arrogant with a team that's gonna lose like a hundred, hundred and five games. Mm-hmm. And like that's just terrible. Like it's it's terrible for like a fan base that was already, you know, already took it uh, you know, on the chin last year with Tony La Russa, things falling apart on him and just the dysfunction in the White Sox front office, not being able to fix that. Now, like this year, uh, you know, there's a brief 13 hours of hope when Kenny Williams and Rick Hahn were fired until like Chris gets is probably the guy reports came out and be like, Oh, great. Like nothing's going to change. Uh, and so like, that's how it's been like month after month being a White Sox fan. And Griffol is just the worst possible ambassador for reaching out because he doesn't reach out. It's just, it's all, What's in it for me? Uh, how can I look okay? And, uh, you know, am I in favor with the only people that count? And it's just, uh, I can see fan interest just swirling down the toilet with him coming back because nobody cares about Pedro Griffol on a, at a managerial level, as a strategist, even as a person, because there's just been no connection as a person. And it's pretty clear on the field. With the players that are playing, yeah, I, you have veterans on this field. You're not playing a lot of rookies, and they're not. They're just not trying. Like, no, yeah, I mean, trying like not Lenin to get Sosa, hurt is what they're doing. Yeah, Lenin Sosa is the only guy born in 2000 or later. So, like, for a rebuilding roster or a a roster that was torn down, it's an old roster. Yeah, like Corey Lee is kind of old for getting his first mm. prolonged shot in the major leagues. Like Andrew Vaughn is kind of old for. You know, um, you know, he's, he's finishing up his third full year. Like, um, you know, Oscar Colas, kind of old for a guy making his first, you know, getting his first major league reps. Zach Remlar is 29. Jesse Schulten is 29. Tuki Tassan has been around a bunch of teams. Like, all these guys who are trying to audition are on the older side for that. So you're not even like, you're, you're not even like, I guess, writing things off as like, oh, that's just a player who just is, you know, this is third year in pro ball or just precocious talent that can't quite, uh, the, the game's speeding up on him, you know, but he'll get, you know, like these are guys who have been around for a while. And so like the, see the effort level being either lackluster or just guys not knowing where to go with the ball or 
you're looking completely overmatched. Like you don't even have the excuse of youth because this is an oldish roster for how young they're playing and the mistakes they're making and how like inexperienced and how open the competition is supposed to be. Yeah, they just don't care. Like they're they're trying not to get hurt and they got vacations booked for early October, Jim. Like that's that's what they're concerned about. Like this is the last road trip for the White Sox in 2023. They're heading to Washington. I'm sure they'll lose that series. And then they go to Boston uh, for the final road trip, road series in 2023. And I'm pretty certain they're going to lose that series. And then they come home and they face Arizona, which Arizona really needs those games. And we'll talk about that in a moment here. And San Diego. And after the San Diego game, I'm sure guys will clean out their locker that night so they don't have to come in the next day and talk to the media. And they're gone. And you won't see them. Might clean it out beforehand. Maybe. In Yasmani Grandal's case, am I playing the final game of the season? Nope. All right. Yeah. See ya. It's been real, guys. <laughs> double yeah. Double birds on the way out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can't wait to hear what Grandal's years with the White Sox went uh, when he's not in a Chicago clubhouse. And this all happened under Pedro Grafal's watch. Like, he just, yeah, couldn't do the job. Still can't do the job. And I really don't want him to do the job next year we're going to take a break but coming up next i've got another rant about white Sox marketing and an updated look at the mlb postseason picture after a word from our sponsors the biggest acts are visiting chicago this summer on top of all the baseball games and other great concerts theater shows too it could be quite the chore and headache trying to secure tickets to all of these shows and events buying tickets shouldn't be stressful use game time to purchase your tickets Game time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for sports, music, comedy, theater near you. They've got killer deals on last minute tickets and their best price guarantee helps eliminate stressing over tickets. If you find tickets in the same section or even row for less, game time will credit you 110% of the difference. That's why game time is the fastest growing ticketing app in the country. Download the game time app, create your account and get $20 off your first purchase using our promo code SOXMACHINE. Terms and conditions apply. Again, create an account and use our promo code SOXMACHINE for $20 off your first ticket purchase. Game time. Last minute tickets, lowest prices, guaranteed. There's no I in team, but there is one in Indeed, and that's the hiring platform that you need to build yours. When you're hiring, you need Indeed. Instead of spending hours on multiple job sites searching for candidates with the right skills, Indeed's a powerful hiring platform that can help you do it all. One of the things I love about Indeed is that it makes hiring all in one place so easy because Indeed does the hard work for you. They show you the candidates whose resumes on Indeed fit your description immediately after you post so you can hire faster. Join more than 3 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. Start hiring now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash sports. Offer good for a limited time. Claim your $75 credit now at Indeed.com slash sports. That's Indeed.com slash sports. And support the show by saying that you heard it on this podcast. Indeed.com slash sports. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Welcome back to the Sox Machine Podcast. The White Sox celebrated the 40th anniversary of the 1983 American League West Division title winners by having Harold Baines, Tony La Russa, and Ron Kittle on the field. And because, well, Jerry pays them to hand out. Oh, and Daryl Boston also stood in the photo, even though he wasn't on the 1983 White Sox. He made his rookie debut in 1984. Nonetheless, Jim... The 1983 White Sox got a tip at the cap, had some ex-players, the manager, the ex-manager on the field, not a big grouping at all. They wore the 83 jerseys on Sunday. They get to celebrate them again. And I feel like the White Sox have been celebrating that 1983 White Sox team for like a decade, which cool you know, whatever, whatever floats your boat. There's a certain demographic of White Sox fans that probably enjoy that. But before the season began, when we talked about upcoming promotions, I was surprised there wasn't like a night dedicated to honoring the 1993 American League West division title team to bring them back for their 30th anniversary. 
They did it in 2018 for the 25th anniversary. And again, the 1993 White Sox team, Frank Thomas, Ozzy, Robin Ventura, Tim Raines, Ron Karkovice, the entire pitching staff, Lance Johnson. Like for many elder millennials, for you and I, that was our team. I wasn't born in 1983. I was born in 1984. Like the first possible season of my lifetime was in 1985. So I get that the White Sox continue to celebrate this godforsaken 1983 team and get to continue wearing those uniforms. But man, if I don't see in the final weekend in San Diego a tip of the cap or bringing back some ex-players from the 93 team to celebrate them, uh, I'm going to be a little jaded here. Because it's like, yeah, we continue to celebrate the 83 team, but... Why isn't there more pomp and circumstance for the 93 White Sox? Well, I think, you know, if they rotate them every five years and being like, well, the, when it's when the year ends with an eight, it'll be 93's turn. When the year ends with a three, it'll be 83's turn. Like, seems like there, yeah, I can understand that argument. Um, also, I wonder, like, given some of the contentious relationships, some... White Sox had of the 93 team, like McDowell didn't end on the nicest of terms. Thomas didn't end on the nicest nope. of terms. Ventura, because of his managerial stint, that got awkward. Um, like, and then the strike happened the year after. Yeah, I'm surprised Darren Jackson, like seeing how like the Jerron Schuler basically said, yeah, go play in Japan, Darren Jackson. They're paying you way more than you're worth. Like, I'm surprised like Jackson came back and hung around. But uh, yeah, just, you know, I can understand like maybe they aren't as willing to, you know, hang around and be ambassadors for the team the way that the 83 team was. Cause yeah, Carlton Fisk, another guy who got shown the door that year in 93. So not the best interpersonal skills, I think on that roster, but it just, you know, when it comes to these um, nostalgia trips, it just shows you how little the white Sox have accomplished. Like if it's, is it the 83 team's turn or the 93 team's turn? Like, you know, what about like all the other years, one divisions, like what years are those like 2000, 2005, 2008, 2021. <laughs> that's yeah. But I mean like that's, you know, that's when it comes to guys who aren't, don't have jobs elsewhere. <laughs> you can make appearance. Like those are the years. And it's just like, you, when you win the world series, those division titles look a lot smaller. So it's like, yeah, why would, you know, 2000 team was okay. Like, they're fun. Like I enjoyed that year and the Jerry Manuel thing with uh, you know the the fight in uh, against the Tigers that brought everything together and that that road trip with Cleveland and New York where they swept it. Yeah, great moments in that season. Uh, they ran out of pitching at the end and in two thousand one showed the how the depth on that team just eroded. But like when they won the World Series, like it just made those division titles look like small the way they should look. They should look you know kind of like you know, acknowledge them once in a while, but just otherwise like know that there's more to accomplish than just winning a division and actually winning a playoff series. Like having a American league champion team would be cool. Like having, you know, just even a team that didn't win at all, but got like most of the way there, it'd be cool to honor them. But just because they keep cycling through, like is it 83 or 93? Is it 2000 or 2008? I guess like, you know, I guess the 2008 will be on mm -hmm. that five-year rotation with, 83 and 93 on what they want to cover and what they want to honor in a given year. But just like, it's to me, it's not so much a, a specific with the 83 team versus 93, but just like, those are the two teams to celebrate because the 77 Sox while special didn't win anything. 72 white Sox didn't win anything. 59 white Sox, you know, most of them are gone, unfortunately. So it's just like that group gets smaller and smaller. So like, it just, you know, every time they highlight these teams, it's like, Oh yeah, those are, one of the handful of teams that accomplished anything in their lifetimes. And that's just, you can't keep going back to that. Well, I think, and that's why I just, any time they have like a 30 year or a 20 year, or 15 year, anything that's not like, you know, kind of uh, quarter centuries, it does make me feel like a little bit, maybe like 40 years because then you start like wondering if guys are going to be around and not taking that for granted. But like, it just becomes like, Oh man, this is the, the pickings are so slim that we have to hear about the, uh, pitching staff in the second half of 83 the record they had and tito landrum and just like you know tito landrum shouldn't loom that large in any <laughs> franchise's memory but because it like ruined the one year where they look like something uh it, it does so yeah just that's i don't know if it's so much a marketing thing but just you know if they're trying to work with things they've accomplished it's been so yeah 
so little. And they're almost like better off like celebrating individual players, like having player days versus team days because there are more memorable players than there are memorable teams. And that might be the way to go. And you bring up a good point because we're starting to see this with other teams. For example, I didn't even know this was happening when I was in Seattle, but Felix Hernandez was named in the Mariners ring of honor. And it was a sold out crowd. And it was really cool to see Seattle fans get hyped up for Felix in Baltimore this past weekend. They added Adam Jones to the Baltimore Orioles ring of honor, their hall of fame. And he got his moment in the sun, the white Sox. I don't think have a hall of fame, a ring of honor. They just have the retired numbers and that's it. Maybe they should have some type of like White Sox Hall of Fame, to your point, to honor individual players, especially if the teams are going to be terrible because there's a lot of players that are worth remembering, but may be lost in memory because the organization is just one big fart. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I forget who it might have been in our comments talking about like how they should have a Wilbur Wood Day, like just somebody who like put insane numbers that nobody can comprehend the number of starts he made the number of innings he threw. Um, and just, uh, until he, like, he got that line drive that shattered his kneecap. Like he was one of the most valuable players in the American league. And it was just him and a couple other pitchers in a given year shouldering like most of the starting pitching innings. And somehow he made it work and it'd be cool to spin that forward and talk about like Wilbur Woods teams aside from like 72 where they, you know, had a, energizing year that was as much dick allen as anybody but like they uh you know there wasn't a whole lot to celebrate like oh there's one year they're mildly interesting you know and then they kind of faded away again but like talking about wilbur wood centering the discussion on him would be like refreshing and learn more about the guy and uh be an educational experience to like you know parents bringing their kids or grandparents bringing their kids being like yeah this is who i saw this is my equivalent of mark burley or this is my equivalent of chris sale or uh, whoever is the star pitcher or player of the day and just being able to spin that for, especially if like, if they're, um, you know, still with it and being able to like tell interesting stories and being able to, um, you know, share some memories that aren't just Ron Kittle because he's around like, that would be cool to hear. So I think like that's one way if they're going to have only have a limited amount of teams and rosters to go through, then make it about the players and, and have that day. And like, you maybe a Wilbur Wood day doesn't sell out the way like a Felix Hernandez day does, but like, um, you know, trying to think who would be the equivalent of like, well, I guess that's the thing. Like they just retired Mark Burley's number in a hurry. So like they, 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 uh, that was, that was fresh. As soon as he retired, like, yep, retired, you're having your day. And then like, there's no way, you know, reason to bring him around anymore. You have to get like Mark Burley to show up randomly, but like Carlos Quentin, like having a Carlos Quentin day or, you know, along those lines of just like, Hey, let's, Get this guy out signing autographs, uh, telling stories, being a, you know, being a cool person to have around for a day, throw out a first pitch, like more of that if they're going to have like such a limited amount of history to mine. I mean, there's a lot of history for the Chicago White Sox. They've been a franchise well, I mean, for more than team 120 history. years, but yeah, good history. Yeah. Very little. Yeah, good history, good team history. Wait, yes. No, I, I think the White Sox should implement a, a ring of honor or a White Sox Hall of Fame and start honoring individual players. I guess it's my way of saying I'm over the 1983 White Sox. Honestly, it's been like a decade. You don't need to keep wearing those uniforms. Let's move on. <laughs> let's let's move on. I don't need any more 1983 White Sox uh, to be brought back. So that was my rant. Now let's talk about the MLB postseason picture because this is what's really fascinating. And when you talk about the game nationally, it's a lot more interesting than the White Sox. So don't be alarmed if future episodes of the Sox Machine podcast is just about everything else but White Sox baseball. I mean, there's the whole Shohei Otani drama that's going on in Los Angeles. But the postseason race, Jim, this is going to be really tight. And with the postseason expansion, I know there was a lot of concern that you could just be honoring mediocre teams that win 83-84 games and sneak into the playoffs as that sixth seed. That's not going to happen in the American League. And when you look at the teams that have already clinched postseason spots, congratulations over the weekend. The Baltimore Orioles have clinched the postseason spot. The Tampa Bay Rays have also clinched the postseason spot. The Atlanta Braves have already won the National League East. That is six straight division titles for the Atlanta Braves. 
And the Los Angeles Dodgers clinched the National League West. That is their 10th division title in the last 11 seasons. You guys are spoiled in Atlanta in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Baltimore won their series against Tampa Bay over the weekend. They're up two games in the American League East with 13 games left to go. Minnesota's up seven games on Cleveland as there's 12 games left to go. Their magic number is six games. And in the American League West, Houston is up one and a half games on Texas and two games on Seattle. So that is a the American League East and West, the division titles are still up for grabs. And this is big for seeding. Houston is playing Baltimore starting on Monday, Jim. That could be a preview of the American League Championship Series. Texas is at home against Boston, and Seattle travels to Oakland. And in all this, the Toronto Blue Jays are still a half game up on Texas. So Seattle is currently out of the postseason right now. Toronto is visiting the Yankees, and that series starts on Tuesday. So your American League playoff picture, again, tight races in the division. Baltimore, the number one seed. Houston, the number two seed. Minnesota pretty much is going to clinch the number three seed. They'll be facing the six seed Texas Rangers as the season were to end today. Tampa Bay would be the fourth seed, and Toronto would be that fifth seed as they are one game ahead of the Seattle Mariners in the wild card. And again, Texas is just a half game ahead of Seattle in the standings. This is going to come right down to the wire as far as the American League playoff picture, Jim. And we may not have any certainty until the final day who wins the divisions and who makes the wild card. Like, this playoff type of structure, I know there's a lot of concern about, but it is clearly working in the American League because we've got some heated races and unfortunately a very good team that's going to win 90-plus games is going to miss the playoffs. Yeah, nobody's getting in by accident, which I think was the biggest fear of expanding right. postseason as a team that didn't want enough. Like, also in the National League, we'll get to that, but just like all these teams like tried adding at the deadline, or they tried to, or had enough talent on hand, or getting healthy to where like they thought they would be getting better. Uh, nobody sold off and was like, "Oh, we're keeping winning. Oh, we're still in it. We're still on the fringe." Like, um, even like the Yankees, they added, uh, they they tried and just aren't going to get there but like yeah that i think that's what you want to see is like this is the um i guess there's no reason to give teams a benefit of the doubt when it came to spending necessarily because of just how cool the free agent markets were for like a few years in a row thinking like oh we just want to be okay and give people the hope like the jerry ryan's are a plan of just being okay to give people hope into the september and that was good enough but no it's it, it, we're seeing like like toronto i was thinking about counting out and now they've won three in a row and the Mariners have faded and like the Texas gets uh, hot and then they get cold again. Like it's, it's a whole bunch of ups and downs and a lot of like zero sum directly built into the races. Like even with the Baltimore and Tampa Bay, the way that like Baltimore looked like they might be fading a little bit. And then they come back with a couple of huge victories. Like all these games count. And it is like, even if it isn't like the traditional pennant races of like four teams get in and the rest of the league is looking on the outside, looking in and you can win a hundred games and be on the outside like in this case you're gonna win 90 it's not quite the same as like you know having a 100 win team that comes up short but still like the same spirit of like teams trying and trying to get better and that's i i'm i'm thankful that at least that's been maintained is that the standards are still high enough to where you have to want to actually you know one build a good enough team and then add to that team at the deadline in order to have it hold up over 162 games who do you like winning the American League East and West? I still like Baltimore, or at least yeah, I, I should say like um, I'm I'm sold on them as like a deep enough team, especially since like you know they just the prospects that they've called up seems well timed. Like Grayson Rodriguez showing up in a big way, like he looks like he might be the internal pitching help they needed, so that's cool. Uh, West, I think I'm going to go with Houston just because uh, as much as the uh yeah i mentioned that i houston's vibes have seemed off in terms of like the jerry jonesification of jim crane uh meddling too much and 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 taking away some of what made them special in the front office like texas is banged up and you know i think they're still showing like some signs of like being a year too early or like just there's a reason why they're as disappointing as they were last year and that kind of looms in my head and then like seattle I just don't know sometimes <laughs> like Seattle. Like I didn't trust them yeah, last year. It depends year. on the week, right? Yeah, Seattle. I didn't trust them last year. And like, there's always something about Seattle that just, I'm not sure if it's like the 
Jerry DePoto, somebody who's been there for a long time and took a while to build a winner, or uh, you know Scott Service being around, like how stable their leadership has been and how little they've accomplished until the last couple of years, or whether it's the travel that they have to do from being you know in the most remote parts of the country uh, for traveling that takes a toll on them in a special way. But for some reason, they're always like a little bit loopy in a way that, uh, you know, Houston is not. So I think that's why I'm going to go with Houston, even if I'm not necessarily, they're not my favorite team either. Well, Tampa Bay's clinched the playoff spot. So out of Toronto, Texas, and Seattle, which two of those teams do you like making the postseason? I guess like Toronto, because I picked them to be my American League World Series pick. Okay. And like they're, they're hanging in there. So I think, you know, they can maybe sneak in as a fifth or sixth seed. So I'll stick with them because uh, who knows how it's going to happen if they get there. But uh, Texas, I think, I think I'm going to go with Seattle just because of the Texas, uh, you know, second half trends versus like the week to week stuff. Yeah, that would be heartbreaking. They, they had a good lead in the division. There was some space between them in Houston and Seattle and to fade. And to fade out of the postseason like that, oh, that would be a really tough pill to swallow, even though it's been a great year for the Texas Rangers. Like like I said, out of those three teams, I mean, Texas, Seattle, Toronto, they're having really good seasons. One of them's going to miss the postseason. And one of those teams would probably easily win the American League Central <laughs> and maybe put up a better fight in the first round of the playoffs than Minnesota. I don't know. Maybe the Twins can win a playoff game. I'm still not certain because uh, it's really hard to gauge them, uh, even facing the White Sox over the weekend. Uh, they have been playing really good baseball in the second half, the Minnesota Twins, and a lot of their team stats offensively, pitching-wise, look impressive. So maybe this is the year. First time since 2004 that they win a playoff game and maybe they could win a playoff series as they they host one. But I, I'm still liking that whoever that six seed is is to upset upset in quotation marks over the Minnesota Twins. But I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with Texas over Seattle. I think Toronto does make it, but I, I am gonna go with Texas over Seattle. And oh gosh, it, it again it's gonna come right down to the wire. There is. No game 163. The Texas Rangers own the tiebreaker over the Toronto Blue Jays. We talked about that in a recent episode of the podcast. Uh, So it may really come down to whatever tiebreakers are between Toronto and Seattle. It's a fascinating race. Again, it's going to come down to the wire. It's going to be very fun to watch. Uh, So I know football is on on the weekends, and that's what everybody draws their attention to. But Monday through Friday, if you have some attention uh, to give, definitely watch what's happening nationally in Major League Baseball. Speaking of nationally, moving over to the National League, the Miami Marlins, Jim, swept the Atlanta Braves. Hello. And Jake Berger went 7 for 14 in that series with two homers and six RBIs. And since Jake Berger's joined the Miami Marlins in 42 games, Berger's hitting 306 with a 362 on base percentage, slugging 531. With eight homers and 23 RBIs, and he's also added 12 doubles. I knew Jake Berger was hitting well for the Miami Marlins, Jim. I didn't know he was hitting this well, and I, I'm happy for the guy because if he can help power the Miami Marlins into the postseason, i going to assume a lot of Marlins fans, and I know it's not a huge fan base, but Jake Berger's, Jake Berger's got a chance to be a cult hero in Miami. Yeah, I had the same impression of you as you in terms of like, given how most of the highlights I'd seen were Berger's homers and like Berger only has, yeah, I put only in quotes, like eight and 42 games. Like that would basically be like 16 over how many plate appearances he had with the White Sox and like he had 25. So like the homers have been a little less frequent, but he's becoming more of a hitter. Like the walks that he drew in his last month with the White Sox, like that skill's kind of hanging around. The strikeouts are coming a little bit. Like he seems to have a better understanding of like what bat to ball stuff he can do. That isn't necessarily like selling out for power. So like uh, there is uh, a hitter coming into shape here. And you know, I mentioned this before, I think on Twitter that, you know, this is basically like Kenny Williams parking meters deal. Like 
you know, Mayor Daly on his way out just like sold off the parking meters and like, oh, that was a really terrible deal. Like the city is never going to get what it paid or or, or, or the revenue it gave up to a, a private company because like it just it was a lack of care or just wanted to cash out while he was going out. And like Kenny Williams, kind of same thing. Like, you know, trade Jake Berger for Jake Eater just because like, I don't know, like I have a I have a hunch and yeah, it's one for one trade. It's really I feel bad for Jake Eater just because like. He's got to be good yeah. now for people like not to be unless the like, burger flames out after one year, which is possible given just his injury history. So like, it's not necessarily um, written yet what the ultimate story of this trade is going to be. But like if burger turns out to be like a decent DH slash third base bat for a team and, you know, eater has to now become like a number three starter, which is like, that's, that's a tough climb for a guy that was going to be sold off for basically like, an extra DH what they you know i think what the white Sox thought they were trading so i am rooting for the marlins though it does make me want to root for the marlins just stick it to white Sox decision making like i'm all for burger embarrassing the white Sox. so good for him keep it up so the miami marlins looking at their tiebreakers they hold the tiebreaker over the cincinnati reds and the san francisco giants own a tiebreaker over the miami marlins uh so if the marlins and reds uh have a tied record at the end of the year. The Marlins ha- own that tiebreaker over the Cincinnati Reds. The Marlins won the series against the Chicago Cubs. They have the tiebreaker over the Cubs. They won the season series against the Diamondbacks. The Marlins own the tiebreaker over the Diamondbacks. So the Marlins own some tiebreakers here, and that's important because <laughs> the Chicago Cubs just got swept by the Arizona Diamondbacks. And the Cubs are fading. The Milwaukee Brewers lead in the National League Central is now six and a half games over the Cubs, seven games over the Cincinnati Reds. The Reds are gaining ground on the Cubs. In the National League, Philadelphia, firm spot as the number four seed. But the fifth and sixth seeds are totally up for grabs right now. The Cubs, 78 and 72. Arizona, 78 and 72. Miami, 78 and 72. Cincinnati, 78 and 73. And like I mentioned, as far as those tiebreakers, Miami Marlins right now own the tiebreaker over the Cubs and Diamondbacks. So the Marlins would be your fifth seed. And because the Diamondbacks won their season series against the Chicago Cubs, the Diamondbacks would be the sixth seed. So right now, because of tiebreakers, the Chicago Cubs would be out of the playoffs. And they had a at least a... a a bubble. They were up two and a half games over the six seed just a week ago, Jim. But man, you got you have a three way tie, and Reds are a half game back to decide the fifth and six seeds. And this really could come down to tiebreakers at the end of the year without having game one sixty threes anymore to decide who moves on and who stays home. And man, that's. This is the true definition of a wild, wild card race in the National League. Yeah, I remember last year when the White Sox were trying to catch Cleveland and Cleveland had secured the tiebreaker. And that was just such a huge difference in terms of like, they have a week ago, you have seven games left, but you have to, like you're trailing by three games, but you have to act like you're trailing by four games because that's effectively what it is. And as the games shrink in terms of uh, number remaining uh, that having that extra win in the back pocket matters so much. So I am like, I am, I guess, you know, when it comes to like rooting more for Arizona and Miami than the Cubs, like it is cool. Like to see that being like, Oh, it's, you know, they can't even look at the standings and take solace in that, like being tied with the Marlins because they're effectively not tied with the Marlins. You know, they, they're on the losing side of that. So they have to get it in gear. And it seems like the uh, Diamondbacks have that, you know, I, I guess Diamondbacks and Reds have that up and down young talent type stuff that kind of swings in both directions. Miami, like, I'm not quite, like, their pitching's pretty good. Offenses, yeah, I think Berger adds a lot to that offense in terms of instant power, which they were lacking. So I think that's, you know, proves why Kim Eng was so interested in it, even though, like, a lot of people ripped the tray at the time. And I thought it was like a... I thought it was an interesting trade just because like both had, you know, both burger and eater had to show that like they could actually keep improving and weren't just like interesting prospects who might be stalled because of one or two fatal flaws. 
or in Berger's case, not a prospect, but still like a young player who might, you know, might never overcome a strikeout issue. But like seeing Berger, what he's added and like a team that's only scored, like I'm looking at their run score, like the second fewest runs in the National League, uh, winning 78 games because like he's actually making huge contact when it matters or like, you know, being able to score an instant run or an instant two runs matters so much given how well the pitching staff is doing and the pitching staff seems to be holding it together better than like say the Cubs staff is, which is kind of falling apart right now. So I feel pretty good about the Marlins right now based on, and, and when you look at the run differential being negative 37, like that's a sign that you shouldn't feel good about them. But I think based on who's healthy and who's playing well, it seems like they have a better mix going for them in terms of like, you know, coming out uh, on the winning end of narrow scores better than what the Cubs have. I know you keep tabs of what's happening in Chicago, Jim, when it comes to sports talk, listening mm-hmm. to six, every the score, et cetera. The Chicago bears look bad. There's no excitement about the upcoming Chicago bulls season. Yeah. Connor Bedard looks like he could be a star, but he's only going to play one third of the game for the Blackhawks. The other two thirds could be played by guys who are not good at hockey. Like if the Chicago Cubs don't make the playoffs, this could be a horrible fall and winter of Chicago sports that everyone is going to have to grind through. And yeah. that's a lot of pressure on the Cubs, but just realizing now, you know, you have four teams almost tied. Three teams are tied and you own zero tiebreakers. You lost the season series to Arizona. You lost the season series to Miami. You lost the season series to Cincinnati. That makes this really tough. Like, obviously the Cubs are going to have to win more games to make the playoffs. Duh. Mm -hmm. But if they end up going 85 and 77 and there's like a three-way tie, then Cubs fans are going to be really upset that even though they have the same record as Arizona and Miami, the Cubs season would be done. And the Marlins and Diamondbacks move on. And they're going to look back at this month and be like, this was a wasted opportunity. It was a really, it was a big struggle for the Cubs at the beginning of the season. They were not playing very good baseball. Remember those White Sox Cubs games? It's like, hey, both teams are playing terrible baseball right now. And Mm -hmm. great for the Cubs to make this turnaround and put them in, put themselves in a position at the game 150 mark of being six games above 500 and fighting for a postseason spot. But as of Monday, September 18th, because of the tiebreakers, the Cubs are out of the playoffs right now. And there's a lot of pressure on them in the city of Chicago. If they don't make the playoffs, like I said, it could be a really rough fall and winter of Chicago sports because nobody in Chicago uh, is performing all that well, except for the Cubs and maybe the Chicago sky. But Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's a lot of pressure on the Cubs. So out of these four teams, the Cubs, Diamondbacks, Marlins, and we'll add in the Cincinnati Reds, the Giants are 76 and 74. They're not dead yet, but there's some distance right now. Who do you like out of these four teams? Two of them make the postseason, Jim. So with 12 games left to go, which two of these four do you like making the postseason? Theme go with, go with the tiebreaker guys. So the Diamondbacks and Marlins. Yeah, I agree with you. Or Marlins and Diamondbacks in that order. Yeah, I I agree with you. So Marlins being the fifth seed, they'd play at the Phillies, and then Diamondbacks would play against the Milwaukee Brewers. That would be a pretty interesting series. Um, Brewers Diamondbacks, both teams really focusing on run prevention this season, especially the Diamondbacks. Now that is a team that is drafted and developed athletic players <laughs> that mm-hmm. the White Sox suddenly want to want to have, even though they're not drafting nor developing athletic players, but that's what they want. So we'll mm-hmm. see what they do to get there. But I agree with you. I like the Marlins and Diamondbacks to make the playoffs. And then, yeah, we get to see Jake Berger. I can see a lot of White Sox fans hopping on the uh, Marlins bandwagon in the postseason just because of Jake Berger and, and hoping Jake Berger has some big moments in the postseason and really adds to the remarkable remarkable turnaround he's had in his career, especially with those injuries and and reaching the postseason. But it's a big week. It's a big couple weeks for Major League Baseball, not for the White Sox. We all know that. But again, we all love baseball, so continue to stay tuned in what's happening elsewhere in the American and National Leagues. But that will do it for this episode of the Sox Machine Podcast. Thank you guys so much for listening. 
If you just discovered the Sox Machine podcast, you can subscribe to our show wherever you listen to podcasts, such as Spotify and Apple Music. We also upload our podcast episodes into our YouTube channel, which you can subscribe to at youtube.com slash Sox Machine. We're on social media, no matter the platform, we're at Sox Machine, or you can follow me on those platforms as well, at Sox Machine underscore Josh. If you enjoy our work and you want more, you can get more by becoming a Patreon supporter at patreon.com slash Sox Machine where our Patreon supporters get exclusive content, ad-free versions of both the podcast and website, and whenever we have new Sox Machine swag, they're the first ones to receive it. Monthly plans start at $2, or you can save with an annual subscription. Again, sign up at patreon.com slash Sox Machine. The Sox Machine Podcast is a production of SoxMachine.com. You're on for all things Chicago White Sox baseball and part of the Blue Wire Podcast Network. Alongside Jim Margulis, I'm Josh Nelson. Thanks for listening and watching.